start our uh, today's conversation. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson. I'm joining you from Aspen, Colorado, uh, and just want to note how, as I'm sure all of you are aware, uh, our colleagues at Aspen Kiev and the extraordinary work they do, their examples of individual bravery and resilience are very much uh, on our minds and in our hearts. Uh, we have the Aspen Ideas Festival uh, going on this week, uh, now a focus on health. The rest of the week, we focus on all the other issues. And I can assure you uh, that uh, Ukraine is the center of attention. There's probably no single topic that gets more attention, more concern. Uh, the criminal invasion of Russia, the extraordinary bravery, resilience of the Ukrainian people, uh, are examples for the world and uh, are very much in our minds. So on behalf of the Aspen Institute in the United States, I just want to thank my colleagues and welcome all of you today. And it's now my privilege to just briefly introduce uh, the chair of Aspen Institute, Kiev, Natalie Zaresko. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you so much for being here. And on behalf of Aspen Institute, Kiev, I want to thank all of the Aspen International family for joining us today for a conversation that is critically important to be had at an international level. I'm just leaving the London Recovery Conference that was organized by the UK and Ukrainian governments to talk about how to rebuild Ukraine. And many people ask the question, why are we talking about this now? And I think part of why we're talking about all of this now is because this is critically important to each and every one of us on this earth. It's common knowledge that the G7 has formed a strong alliance. But the reason that we need to speak about this more broadly internationally is because really what's happening in Ukraine is critical to everyone on this globe, not just the G7, not just the Western Alliance. And when asked why, I'll just give a couple reasons. Number one, this is genocide. And even if the international community has been lax and has failed in the past to respond properly to other genocides in the world, it does not mean that we should repeat that mistake. In fact, we should learn from that mistake and the entire international community should be with us trying to ensure that it never happens again anywhere on this globe. Second, this truly is an issue for the globe from the perspective of each and every country wanting to have respect for its borders and territorial integrity. If we allow brute force to change borders in Ukraine, then that brute force can be used anywhere in the globe, from Latin America to Southeast Asia to, to, to the Middle East and onwards. This is defining the world within which we will be living, our children and our grandchildren. Third, Ukraine is important to the globe, from food security to energy security and so much more. And lastly, I'd like just quickly to respond to the issue that many have raised, that this is a proxy war between the United States and, and Russia. I want to urge everyone listening to hear our speakers today because Ukraine has agency. Ukraine does exist and fights for itself, not on behalf of someone and not for someone else. So for all these reasons today, I am so proud and so grateful to Aspen US, our Aspen International Community, our moderator, Susan Glasser, and all of our speakers for giving us this opportunity to learn, to listen, and to consider all the reasons why this is important. Thank you so much. Susan? Well, Natalie, I want to thank you and Elliot uh, uh, and everyone who's joined us today uh, for offering not only this platform uh, for this important conversation, but, you know, an incredibly I think uh, thoughtful, uh, informed, and you know, really uh, provocative in the best sense of the word uh, group of speakers. So uh, it does seem like the timing for a conversation like this right now is uh, is is very 
important, not only because uh, events are being shaped on the ground. Uh, and, and, and as you said, there's not only an agency to Ukraine, uh, but an urgency uh, to understanding how things look uh, in Kyiv, as well as here in Washington, as well as in London, where uh, Natalie has been at this uh, at this conference right now. So I'd love to just introduce our speakers. And I, I have to say, I was honored to be asked to join this group because it's it's such an incredibly you know thoughtful group, but also because I want to hear what they have to say. I think it's an important conversation uh, where we are a year and a half uh, after this full scale Russian invasion and where we think we're going. So let me just very quickly introduce uh, these speakers, many of whom need little introduction, and then we can jump right in. Um, First, we have Vladimir Yermolenko, uh, who is a very well-known uh, Ukrainian writer, journalist, philosopher, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, you may know him from his work with Internews Ukraine. Uh, he is he is an eloquent voice uh, uh, in English, uh, I must say as well, uh, across uh, you know Twitter and other social media platforms. Uh, also, we have Alexandra Madvichik. Uh, the head of the Center for Civil Liberties, of course, in Ukraine, and the 2022 Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Jonathan Littell joins us as well. He is a well-known writer and filmmaker, and he has been a powerful voice uh, helping us to make sense of what's happening in this, you know, insensible conflict from the very start. And Jonathan, thank you for being with us today. And here in Washington, where I am as well, we also have Ambassador William Taylor, Bill Taylor, uh, who, uh, of course, was the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine from 2006 to 2009, as well as his brief return tour from a few years ago. And he is currently the vice president uh, for Europe and Russia at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And again, I'm just Delighted to have all of them with us. I think it would be good to go ahead and start today with a perspective and a voice uh, uh, from the ground, uh, and to to get us, you know, sort of started in the conversation. Vladimir, I I hope that you can uh, kick us off with some thoughts about uh, what it is you think we're seeing right now in in this phase of the conflict, and uh, you know. What is your biggest fear as you think about the international community and what it does and doesn't understand about, about the war? Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, it's a big honor for me to speak in such an audience and a uh, um, you know, big honor also to speak at uh, Aspen Institute. So uh, I do think that th there are some mi misunderstandings about this conflict globally. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, we, we are trying to struggle against. Of course, the word, the very word conflict is not appropriate because this is a real war. And for us, it is a war from 2014. So when uh, there are descriptions that uh, we kind of account this war from 2022, uh, it's it's misleading uh, for us, for Ukrainians. It's also misleading then when people are talking about Ukraine war or Ukraine conflict, Ukraine crisis. These these are uh, the, the wars that we hate, obviously, because it's uh, you, you do not call uh, a uh, 1st September 1939 a Poland crisis or a Poland conflict, right? You, you call it a somewhere uh, somewhat differently. I think another misperception is that people think that it is all about evil Putin's regime and uh, there is some, um, you know, good Russian, good Russia, good Russian society, which is there and we just need to topple Putin's regime and everything will be fine. Uh, I think in Ukraine, we're much more skeptical about it uh, because uh, for us, it's actually the story which goes very deep into centuries and uh, it's related, obviously, with Russian imperialism and uh, with Russian perception of its so-called uh, so-called space. So, uh, for us, um, it is really important to understand that uh, there is a big problem of the Russian model of society itself, uh, which is uh, which is uh, cannot really think about itself in terms of a nation state. Russia 
there is a paradox that Russia, there is Russian nationalism, but there is no, no Russian nation. The paradox is that Russian nation defines itself as an empire. And in this empire, uh, Kyiv and Minsk, for example, Ukraine and Belarus are uh, important elements of this. And there is one difference that I try always to uh, talk about when I uh, speak about the Russian imperialism, how, how it is different from, for, for example, from the Western imperialisms of the 19th century, let's say, is that Western imperialisms, the maritime empires were considering, were colonizing distant nations and were considering difference as a tool of domination. So they were saying, you are different from us. You will ne never become the same as us. Whereas Russian imperialism is a continental imperialism. And with regard to Ukrainians, Belarusians, and other nations around, it says that uh, you will not be uh, different from us. You, you need to be the same as us. So this imperialism also presupposes this assimilation process. And therefore, th this is what we, uh, what we see uh, in this war is the attempt to erase the Ukrainian identity, is to attempt to erase the very difference that differentiates Ukrainian political uh, culture from the Russian political culture. And we see all that in the occupied territories, how Russians come, how they pick up those uh, people who really are the, the vocal representatives of the Ukrainian identity. Right now, I'm sitting in, in, in the office of Pan Ukraine. Right now, we had a meeting uh, with the, the family of Volodymyr Vakulenko, a writer who was kidnapped and killed by Russians in Kapitolivka near Izum. And uh, my colleagues just found his diaries and uh, uh, it is now published and it is now being presented on, on Book Arsenal. So uh, why Russians would pick up a Ukrainian writer who, who, would, who was writing for children and, uh, and kill him just because this fight against identity uh, another example, we just came back from the northern uh, Kharkiv region and we visited a, a village called uh, Nechvolodivka. And uh, the mayor of this village was two times kidnapped by the Russians and uh, tortured. And one thing he told us that he was told by other people who were tortured, that the key thing about torture is that you, you do not fall down. You do not fall down because the, the, the moment you fall down, uh, they start kicking you with 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 the legs, and you you are done. They they will most probably kill you. So I think it's a metaphor about Ukrainian fight right now. So Ukrainians did not fall down on the first days, and are not going to to fall down in the in, in the next days. Uh, you asked me about fear. I think Ukrainians do not. Well, it's it's probably a, an exaggeration to say we're not having fear, but fear is not the, really the word that we are describing. Uh, what is what is happening? So, of course, you 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 might have fear from the explosions, from the occupation, from from missile attacks, and many many other things. But there is a very very big. Uh, very big element of of uh, of resilience and of readiness to to fight and to fight back. And uh, I always hear from our soldiers that we will defend ourselves uh, regardless of the fact, will there be a support from outside or there won't be any support from outside. But of course we need this support. And um, I think it's, it's also kind of a, a bit of illusion right now to think that the war can be uh, ended very quickly. Uh, it can happen in that way. Because in this geography, history sometimes is very rapid. So the Russian Empire has fallen in a few days in 1917. Uh, the Soviet Empire has fallen in three days in 1991. I, I really hope and I believe that the, the, the current Russian Empire was, will always also fall in a few days. But we, we don't know when these few days will happen. They can happen in one month. They can happen in 10 years. And in this respect... When we're talking about reconstruction, rebuilding, I agree with Natalia that this is really a very important talk today because we cannot wait until the full victory. We need to work already now uh, on reconstruction of, of Ukrainian economy. You know that how how much it is it is suffering from uh, from from many Russian attacks. How much for decades for decades there will be consequences of the of the Kahovka Dam explosion. And there is now this uh, blackmail about the nuclear power as well. 
but uh, I have an impression that we need to be prepared for a long-term uh, uh, fight and for a long-term resilience. So long-term resilience meaning that Ukraine needs to have its economy, which can be a wartime economy, uh, which will turn the war into um, an, an element in which we are living, unfortunately. And uh, despite this element that uh, that Ukrainian economy will will run and uh, and and uh, people will start coming back because we have so much outflow of citizens. And one last thing that I, I would like to stress, and I will end on this, is that, and I will pass probably to Alexandra, my friend, uh, who is uh, who will who always talks about about the issue of human rights. That we need to understand one thing is that uh, the all the conventions about the war in in twentieth century were made to, you know, in order to invent a law which will limit violence. We need to understand that current Russian regime and current Russian state thinks in absolutely different way. It doesn't think how the law can limit violence. It thinks in the way how violence can limit law, how violence can destroy law. And therefore, this culture of violence, of utmost violence, which really is present here, it's not just a case of this war. When we talk about uh, with journalists who know the war in Syria and how, how Russians were bombing Syrian hospitals, we, we see that pattern repeating. Uh, when we talk with journalists who visited the war in Chechnya, and, and here I would pass also to Jonathan, uh, who knows, and Chechnya war and Syrian war much better than me, we see that uh, pattern also of utmost violence. And why it is present? Because the evil of the Russian Empire, of the Stalinist regime of Russian Empire of the 19th, 18th century, were not properly condemned, were not properly judged. There was no justice in this geography about this imperial evil. And I think this is the point where justice should come back. Well, Vladimir, thank you very much for that. There's so much to unpack that we'll get back to in our questions, but I'm glad. I think it's such an important note that you just ended on this question of accountability and justice and how can you move forward without reckoning with what uh, with what has already occurred and what is currently occurring. Alexandra, that seems like an important starting point for you with your insistence upon both justice and accountability. And so I hope you can expand on those themes. And I guess I would also ask you the question that I asked Vladimir, which is, uh, what is it, as you're speaking to an international audience, where do you find the gap between how things look to you there uh, in Kyiv and what the understanding of this war is uh, outside of uh, Ukraine and outside of the lived experience of it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, it's a huge honor for me to be together with other distinguished uh, panelists on this discussion. I am a human rights lawyer and I have been documenting war crimes uh, uh, in this war which Russia started against Ukraine uh, since 2014. Very different. It's very important to highlight that this war started not in February 22, but in February 2014, when Ukraine obtained the chance for the quick democratic transformation after the collapse of the authoritarian regime due to revolution of dignity. And in order to stop us on this way, Russia started this war of aggression. Russia occupied Crimea, part of Lugansk and Donetsk regions, and last year extended this war to the large-scale invasion. Because Putin is not afraid of NATO. Putin is afraid of the idea of freedom. And this is something which is still not very visible for countries who are far from on the context, that this is not just a war between two states, Russia and Ukraine. This is a war between two systems authoritarianism and democracy. And with this war, with all this cruelty, Putin tries not just to punish Ukrainian people for our democratic choice, which we made nine years ago. He also tries to convince the whole world that democracy, rule of law, and human rights are fake values because they couldn't protect you during the war. 
And this is not just the problem of Ukraine to respond something to this value dimension of this war. It's a task for entire international community. And that is why we must demonstrate justice. I speak about justice as a precondition to the sustainable peace in our region, where Russia for decades uses the war as the tool how to achieve their geopolitical interests, and for decades uses war crimes and the methods how to win this war. Russian troops committed horrible war crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Syria, in Libya, in other countries of the world. And they have never been punished for this. The bombarding of Aleppo was possible because before Russia destroyed a Grozny, the town with a half million population. The total ruin of Mariupol was possible because before Russia destroyed, bombarded Aleppo and enjoyed impunity. This chain of impunity lead to a situation that Russians start to believe they can do whatever they want. We uh, document where crime sense uh, when large-scale invasion started, united our efforts with dozens of organizations in one tribunal for Putin initiative, we built all Ukrainian network of local documentators, covered the whole Ukraine, including occupied territories. And in our database is 41,000 episodes of war crimes. 41,000. It's a huge amount, but still a tip of iceberg. And there is no justification for such Russian action. There is no legitimate purpose to force people go down to the basement to order them to appoint several volunteers and no purpose in shooting them. There is no purpose in having fun using the tanks firing on people on bicycles whose bodies lay scattered around the streets until liberation. There is no purpose in breaking someone's house, killing the owner and raping the wife next to her nine-year-old child. There is no military necessity in doing this. Russians have done these horrible things only because they could. And that is why we must break the circle of impunity. We must demonstrate justice for all victims affected by this war. And it's important not just for Ukrainians. It's also a way how to prevent the next Russian attack against next nations. As Volodymyr Yermolenko often said, Russia is empire and empire has a center but has no borders. If we will not be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. Well, that's a chilling thought and I think an important one to sort of bring in our, our voices from, you know, from outside the rest of the world. Now, you referred, Alexandra, to this as essentially a values uh, conflict in addition to, you know, the very real uh, consequence of the Russian way of war being carried out, you know, on the territory of Ukraine. Ambassador Taylor, we're in Washington today, uh, and I think it's it's a very actually kind of symbolically good day to be having this conversation. Uh, we have President Biden, who often speaks, as as Alexandra just did, about uh, the conflict in the world today as one between democracies and autocracies. And that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, actually, uh, even within his own administration on, you know, this question of uh, what role values place uh, to be placed in American foreign policy. And we have uh, right today the visit of Indian Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi, uh, who is really in many ways a, a, the most important test of uh, whether President Biden, you know, how he chooses to implement that uh, vision. Uh, and many people see that he is essentially uh, moving away from uh, a foreign policy based on the idea of a conflict between democracy and autocracy when it comes to looking past the human rights violations because India 
is a good partner for the United States in its rivalry with China. Uh, and of course, it has not been willing to sign up uh, to support Ukraine in the way that uh, many European uh, allies and partners have. So I just wonder if you can help us uh, understand a little bit what this calculus here in Washington means, because it strikes me that it's very much uh, important part of uh, why we're having this discussion today. What does the war in Ukraine that Russia is waging mean internationally? Susan, I think you're exactly right. It is important to, to have this conversation, to understand what's at stake. <clears throat> and all of the people who have spoken so far, <clears throat> including Natalie uh, Juresko, um, and Vladimir and Alexandra, have, have made the points about why it's so important for Ukraine to win this war, uh, why it is so important uh, to, to the world, um, as, as several have, have pointed out. Uh, and you raised the right point, Susan. That is, uh, how to win this war is going to is a challenge for the United States. It's a challenge for Ukraine. It's a challenge for all of Ukraine's allies. And Ukraine has 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 strong allies. Um, and the United States has helped develop that alliance, that coalition. Um, and yes, um, most of the most of the most of the allies, uh, most of the participants in this coalition are democracies. Uh, most have the values uh, that Alexander pointed out. Um, but it's also important to motivate the rest of the world. It, it, the, the breadth of this alliance is important. Um, India may not be the best democracy. We may not be the best democracy, but we we need India to do some things. We need China to do some things, or indeed not do some things. We need China to continue not to provide weapons um, and ammunition and artillery rounds um, to the Russians. Uh, so far, they have not. They're not a democracy. They don't have the values that we do. But we, but we need the Chinese not to support the Russians in the way that the Russians have been asking them to. So this is complicated. The the motivation for this alliance that, uh, frankly, the United States leads on behalf of Ukraine, that Ukraine inspires. Ukraine inspires this, this alliance, inspires us. Um, I'm humbled to be on the, on the screen, um, uh, Susan, with, with, with brave Ukrainians, wherever they are, whether they are on the front lines, as uh, Vladimir has pointed out, or whether they are thinkers or whether they're human rights defenders, whether they're journalists, uh, we are humbled to be, be allied with them and to support them, and we will continue to support them. Um, and we need the rest of the world to do that as well in every way that it can. The, the values uh, are important for most of our alliance, but not all. Um, we do need to pull the rest uh, in. Natalie made the point um that uh that this is not a proxy war um this is a war that russia has has undertaken against ukraine and every nation democracy or not wants to be secure in their own borders every nation democracy or not wants to be sovereign wants to be seen to be sovereign and as long as one nation one big powerful nation like russia powerful in some ways, weak in others, uh, can invade its neighbor, then no nation is, is secure. No nation is sovereign. No borders are, are sacrosanct. So it's, it's important that we are motivated by uh, the values uh, that Alexander uh, talked about. Um, it's also important that Ukraine win this war for accountability, for the world that we want to live in, uh, because it is genocide, because Ukraine is a sovereign nation that has the, that's due the respect um, that uh, that empires have to be defeated, we need all of the efforts that we can mount. So it's a it's it's both, Susan. It's both. It's both the values um, and the and the importance of allies. Jonathan, uh, there was a reference, uh, and I think an important one to you know the the serial abuses uh giving rise one after the other the you know the war in chechnya uh unpunished human rights violations the attacks 
uh, that Russia carried out in Syria and the bombing of Aleppo, and that this Russian playbook, of course, is now being used uh, on the territory of its neighbor, Ukraine. Why do you think it is? I mean, it, you know, having seen it yourself uh, and covered it as a journalist, uh, this 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 template, this this playbook uh, from from where does it spring and what do you think are possible responses uh, that should shape uh, finally this 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 enormous uh, consequence of years of impunity? You wrote a great piece a while back pointing out that um, you know, Vladimir Putin's very rise to power was accompanied, uh, you know, with the use of military force and that that has been, you know, uh, inextricably tied to his uh, uh, his more than two decades ruling Russia. And I'm curious what you think the consequences are that that he actually is a man, you know, who has governed uh, from the start uh, by the sword, as it were. Um, thank you, Susan. I really, again, like all the other speakers, really appreciate being given this opportunity and to, to participate in this panel. Um, to start answering your question, which is a very complex one, I would take it actually a lot further back um, to at least the beginning of the 20th century. Russia in the contemporary age, Tsarist Russia and then its Soviet successor state and now modern Russia as a successor to the Soviet Union, has been an incredibly incompetent military power. Um, their first two wars of the modern age against Japan and then World War I against the, the Axis powers, uh, they failed, they performed miserably and they lost quite severely. Um, in World War II, they were finally able to prevail against a much more competent and um, ma modern army basically through two factors, foreign aid, which was provided by the United States, the same way that the United States is now helping Ukraine, which was a massive leverage for them to prevail, and actual mass, mass of men and willingness to let the people, their soldiers, die en masse without any regard to their lives, to their safety, just overwhelming force is how they finally managed to overcome against um, Nazi Germany. And in this way of waging war, um, they were perpetuating a long Russian tradition, which is the brutalization of its own citizens. I think one important point we need to make is that before brutalizing other people, whether Syrians, Ukrainians, Chechens, or whatever, Russia has always been extremely good at brutalizing its own citizens. I mean, the centuries of servage, of serfdom, sorry, um, and in you know, continuing from the Tsar's tradition, the Gulag tradition, the whole carceral tradition in Russia, in which millions and millions and millions of people have gone through this carceral system, um, going through and then reproducing incredible levels of interpersonal violence. I think this violence, which has permeated the whole society, has been there in their military endeavors, both at the levels of the highest command, which is willing to sacrifice great masses of men for very small gains, and at the interpersonal level, at the lowest levels of the armies. And so already in World War II, what you see, the way you see this playing out is, you know, they finally are able to stop the Germans in Stalingrad and roll back the other way. And once they cross their own border, their soldiers are given free license to do pretty much anything they want, to loot, to rape, uh, and to murder people. Uh, because this is the only way, because they don't have the tools to... to First of all, manage their soldiers properly to preserve their lives, and second of all, to reward them for the insane sacrifices they're going through. This cutting them loose to help themselves is the only thing that the command has to offer its troops when they're waging this kind of war. And I don't see anything has changed. I mean, I think, you know, from what I know of the Afghan war, it was very similar. They underperformed massively against a very small under-equipped guerrilla army, and they were only able to prevail by inflicting insane amounts of civilian casualties by destroying entire villages and towns through Zechiskas, through all kinds of exactions. And then the next conflict that post-Soviet Russia waged, which I was witness to, is the first Chechen war and then the second Chechen war. They simply just continued with these methods. They think it's going to be easy. They go in with all their tanks, and then it turns out to be a complete disaster. 
and they're surprised. And then they respond with brute overwhelming force, as Alexandra was saying, leveling Grozny and cutting their soldiers loose to commit any kinds of exactions they want to. Beyond a will to towards, I don't see it as a will towards evil. I simply see it as sheer incompetence and an inability to perform otherwise. They just don't know how to do it otherwise. They tried to modernize their army after the Second Chechen War. Um, I saw some of the results of that and some of the elite troops that were deployed in Georgia, uh, which I also covered the Georgian War in 2008. And I have to say, it's the only time I've seen Russian troops behaving professionally and accurately, as we say, akuratna, um, fairly decently towards the civilian populations, no massive crimes. I mean, there were a lot of war crimes committed in the Georgian War, but they were mostly committed by the Ossetian militias that were working with the Russian forces. The Russian forces were actually remarkably well behaved um, in, in that war. But that seems to have been only like sort of the, the tip of the iceberg, the tiny little point of the army that they managed to modernize, which, of course, as we know, uh, has pretty much gotten wiped out completely in the first days of the war in Ukraine. And they've just reverted back to the old software, which is everything the other speakers have been descri describing, the mass destruction of cities, the mass murder of people. The, the level of violence against people, I really think has to be seen as an interplay between many dynamics there is i don't see it as i mean yes it's very hard to to arbitrate these questions there is a genocidal discourse very clear in the russian propaganda and we we see it we hear it uh sir david's text at the beginning of the war which is talking about the final solution to the ukrainian problem and, and things like that it's quite clear that it's there on the propaganda side but the russian command side what I see is much more incompetence and an inability to control their troops. I think the only way that they know how to control the territories they occupy is through sheer reign of terror, simply because they don't know how to do anything else. And so they do it. And so their men are told to go and terrorize everybody, which means arrest them arbitrarily, torture them, rape their women, rape the men too, actually, for that matter, and murder people quite arbitrarily in the hope that the rest of the population will be so scared that they will back down and not, you know, inform, send information to, to the Ukrainian armed forces and all these things that the Russian occupiers are afraid of. Clearly, it doesn't work. I mean, it just doesn't work. All it does is galvanize resistance. They had huge networks of resistance in Harrison before it fell. We know they have people... Uh, behind the lines in all the newly occupied territories who are doing the same thing. But this is simply the way Russia does war because it's incapable structurally of doing it any other way. Um, and it's it's not only massively criminal, it's also massively inefficient. We see what happens when the, this Russian army is confronted with a Western trained and Western equipped army, very motivated to fight in their own territory. The Russians cannot prevail. And we saw it in Bakhmut, you know, this, this massive meat grinder took him 10 months and an insane amount of human lives to occupy one small town, uh, is pretty typical of the real balance of force. Um, and I think Russia knows this, and I think Putin knows this, that, you know, this is the best they can do. They can't do any better. So this is why we get all the nuclear threats, because they're terrified, of course, of NATO getting more directly involved. So they're waving the the nuclear threat all the time to make sure NATO backs off, you know, doesn't go further than it's already gone. Um, but basically, they're in a very weak position. They they thought it would be over in a couple of days, just like Crimea had been, uh, just like they thought Grozny would be when they went in on New Year's Eve, uh, nineteen ninety five, and it didn't turn out that way. It must be said. The last point I'd like to make is that while this is very unpleasant for uh, Putin and his regime in terms of their Ukrainian adventure, it actually kind of serves their purpose back home. It has permitted them, there is benefit to them to what is going on now, which is it has allowed them to achieve the final full control, the full militarization of their society that they always kind of dreamed of, but never could quite pull off. Now they've gotten rid of all the bad eggs from their point of view, which is the several hundreds of thousands of incredibly talented democratically oriented Russians who've emigrated. Um, they can crack down on anybody they want, and they do all the time through massive internal terror. 
they militarize entire society through education, through propaganda, through the slogans, and then through conscription. And in a way, this will permit the regime to actually go on possibly longer than it might have gone on without this war. Um, it will basically go on until the war is definitively lost and the regime collapses. But I think the two are now intricate. There will be no peace with Putin is basically the point I'm trying to make because of political reasons. Um, his survival as a, him and his regime is now intrinsically linked to this war, not just to be seen to be winning it, but actually to keeping it going because of what it allows them to do at home. And so the Ukrainian victory is the only thing that will put an end to this endless cycle. Uh, then, of course, what comes after, we can save that for later in the discussion. Yeah, no, that is actually the perfect uh, the the perfect next point to pick up on. And thank you, because I think that one thing I'm hearing from you and and from the other panelists is to to contextualize this in in a pretty long sweep of um, Russian history, and uh, you know that that is so important for people who don't necessarily tend to think in those terms. But uh, Vladimir, I do think that that uh, these excellent points from Jonathan do immediately raise the question of uh, what kind of a Russia can Ukraine even envision? Uh, you know, geography will remain geography uh, and history will remain history. These are long, deep patterns. They're not simply uh, an isolated problem with a single uh, uh, out of control leader, I think is is one of the points that you can take from, from what we're hearing today. And so, I guess my question to you is tell us a little bit about what the conversation and your, the thinking in Ukraine is uh, about a viable future with Russia. I'm not talking about, you know, the details of negotiations that one could see or anything like that. I'm talking about, uh, you know, what is a potential long term path forward, given uh, the realities of geography for your country? Thank you, Susan. First, let, let me follow up a little bit of, of, on what Jonathan has said. Um, I really do agree of, with many of his points, and uh, I really like the fact that uh, we kind of, uh, with with a part of uh, Western intellectuals, were really on the same page, and this is very, very, very good. But I, I would disagree uh, on his stress of this incompetence thing, because I do think we, we need to kind of... Uh, uh, frame the discourse rather not about these technicalities and questions of professionalism of competence of incompetence i do i i really think that this is a moral question so we need to ask a, not even the geopolitical question but a moral question about russia because russian army is not that incompetent uh, and we hear that from ukrainian soldiers i mean don't underestimate russian army yes they they did a lot of mistakes but they can also be smart and they can be using technologies and they can be really witty and uh, it's 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 a it's a difficult enemy yes we understand that there is this uh, what jonathan was talking about and i fully agree that th there is this pattern of just sacrificing a lot of lot of people uh, but it's not only that. So uh, it's it's really we have a different uh, pattern of attitude, for example, to the dead soldiers. This is a very important thing, and, and it says a lot about uh, about uh, any any given culture. So we usually have the jokes among Ukrainian soldiers that you cannot really exchange the bodies of the dead soldiers on the one hand for the on the other hand you need to suggest to russians somewhere else because some something else because they don't don't care about this their dead soldiers and and this is partially true so i do think that uh, this brutalization of self brutalization or even self colonization this spirit of violence which permeates the the russian political culture and russian society i do think that we need to find the causes there so it's it's precisely because a Russian citizen, a typical Russian citizen, is finding him or herself in a climate of a total violence when you either, you know, um, a masochist or you're a sadist. It's precisely because of that that uh, uh, you kind of feel uh, that feeling that you need a war in order to punish somebody else because everybody punishes you and you need a war in order to punish someone uh, somewhere else. So I do think that the question about the uh, 
the future of Russia should be posed uh, not only in the geopolitical way, but also in the moral way. And um, uh, yes, there is kind of this mistrust of Ukrainians towards not only the Putin regime, but towards also the Russian opposition, which in 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 the views of many Ukrainian intellectuals uh, are not really up to the point of rethinking the deep causes of of this war, because this war is a continuation of not only Chechen Syrian war, uh, uh, Georgian war, etc. Putin is a, a hair of KGB, right? This KGB style of culture. He's a hair of the those uncovered there officers who were killing uh, 500 people per day on 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 Stalinist poly polygons in 1930s. And one of the psychologists about that is that precisely this feeling of impunity that Alexandra mentioned. They're doing this war not only to seed fear. This is a typical thing that tyrants do. They're doing this war also to say to themselves. Okay, you can do nothing about this. You can do nothing in response. And this feeling of impunity is, is very important. Now, Susan, come, coming back to your question, I think we also need to go away from this kind of a typical play, Putin always wins and democracies are weak, etc. So I do think that Ukrainian fight shows that democracies can be strong against autocracies. And basically, we see that what is happening with Russia and, and, and why Russia is so fearful right now about what is going on is that we really see that Russian empire shrinks. It is shrinking. Because if you look at the 18th century, uh, the key story of the 18th century is how the Asian empire, Moscovy empire, is turning into the European empire, the Russian empire, the Peter I, how it goes to the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. And I think that what is happening with the independence of the Baltic states, with the accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO, and with Ukrainian independence, which we, we really, of course, are sure that Ukraine will prevail here, is that Russia is pushed away from the Baltic Sea and Black Sea. Uh, if you look at the Russian debates in the 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, the key story was whether Russia will be a Mediterranean power whether Russia will be a new Byzantium. You have this Byzantinist ideology, etc. Now there is not a question about this, right? So Russia is really going a little bit farther and farther away from Europe. And uh, this is, I think, a painful story to it itself. So it, it wanted to be a kind of a, the other of Europe throughout its history, throughout its culture. It's like, we are Europe, but not that Europe that you imagine. We are the other of Europe. But now it, um, it understands, and very dramatically for itself, that it pushed away and away from Europe. And I think this is a, a dramatic and tragic thought for, for Russia itself. So what Ukrainians want from a future of Russia? Uh, on the very tactical level, of course, change of the regime, change of the Russian constitution, because we have five Ukrainian regions in the, in the Russian constitution, unless we changed it, Russia will perceive Ukrainian territories as Russian territories. Russia will perceive Zaporizhia, Kherson uh, as Russian cities. The next is, of course, the imperialization of Russia. What does it mean? Well, let's think about how Russia can be a genuine federation, at least, with the, with the capacities, with powers that the subjects of federation have. Uh, not a really centralized empire, but a, a genuine federation or confederation. And this is very important. And the next thing is, of course, I, I do think that the Russian culture should uh, should do a, a major work to uh, to find this basis for the, the values of, of liberty uh, that uh, on which they should be based upon. Because the problem of this Russian intellectual tradition is that whether you are imperialist or you are liberal or you're totalitarian or you're Marxist or you're conservative, you always think in terms of great Russia. And great Russia is really a, a force that uh, is sacrificing people. So this idea is toxic for Russia. This idea of the great Russia is toxic. It is the idea that kills not only Ukrainians, Georgians, Syrians, Chechens. It's also the idea that kills Russia themselves. And uh, the thing is about Russian history is that indeed defeats in wars are beneficial for Russia itself. So uh, 
There's so much to unpack there. I do, Alexandra, I, I want to know if you agree uh, with this idea, first of all, that there can be no, uh, essentially no peace with Putin, uh, which was uh, Jonathan's point. It's an important point, but also more importantly, what accountability means to you when it comes to the idea of uh, a Russia that could be, uh, what model of uh, neighbor do you envision for Ukraine uh, that can work? Uh, a Russia that is an outlaw nation, isolated, uh, North Korea-like is probably not in, in Ukraine's interest either. And I'm just, I'm just curious how you think about that right now. Uh, we are documenting war crimes and uh, in order sooner or later, all people who committed these crimes by their own hands, as well as Putin, Lukashenko and other senior political leadership and high military command of Russian state will be brought to justice. I work directly with people who survived hell and I know that they need to restore not just their broken lives, broken visions of the future but also they are broken belief that rule of law is essential and justice is possible even though delayed in time uh, but this uh, about legal categories i would like to emphasize on uh, historical categories because it's not just putin's war uh, the problem is that majority of russians supported this war of aggression Putin governed country not just with repressions and censorship, but with a special social contract which is based on Russian glory. And the problem is that majority of Russians still see their glory in a forcible restoration of Russian empire. So that is why Russian people will have bring responsibility for this shameful page of the history and um, and also, in from practical point of view, it means that Russia needs to be defeated. Ukrainian victory will provide a chance for democratic future of Russia itself, because only Ukrainian victory can push Russians to reflect their imperialistic culture. Jonathan, I want to actually quickly go to you before finishing with Ambassador Taylor, because this raises, I think, you know, this is sort of the follow up to your points about um, uh, a long scope and sweep of uh, history suggesting it's a Russian way of war and not just uh, the actions of uh, an individual leader or even an individual uh, uh, sort of regime, you know, that that's following this particular policy course. Um, what are the implications, as you see them, of your no peace with uh, with Putin in power? Is, is there a viable model to suggest uh, that accountability of the sort that Alexandra is is suggesting is necessary is even possible, uh, given the Russian population's participation in this in this war and all of the associated atrocities and crimes that have gone along with it? Um, it's obviously a very tricky question to answer. I mean, I fully agree with Alexandra 100% about the need for accountability and the need for justice. I'm extremely pessimistic about its feasibility. Um, I mean, you know, there was justice after World War II for a very simple reason, is that many, many armies rolled over Germany. Germany surrendered unilaterally, capitulated. And so the people who had won the war decisively were able to set up a judicial process and judge the Nazi leadership for its war crimes. This is not going to happen in this war. And the best Ukraine can hope for, and I think the best, the most Ukraine wants is to regain its own territory. There's certainly no idea that Ukraine or NATO or anybody is going to invade Russia. If the Putin regime falls, um, which I very much hope it will, my feeling is it will fall from the inside. It will be an internal coup people within the regime deciding that the old man is no longer useful and we need to move on and try to re-stabilize things in a different way and preserve the regime as a whole. So Putin himself, if he goes this way, will go violently and there probably won't be a Putin left to judge. 
or he'll just die of old age and will be replaced by someone within his regime. But it will be a violent process, and there will be a lot of death, a lot of blood, and whoever comes out on top is probably someone that the rest of the world is going to want to talk to to stabilize things. And I don't think justice will be a priority, at least for the global community. I'm not talking about Ukraine here, but you know, Europe and the United States. I think stabilizing Russia with all its nuclear weapons will be a lot more important than going after um, war criminals in the eyes of the Western powers. The only real hope I see for the future is a complete collapse of the Russian regime. And as uh, Volodymyr was saying, you know, a new constitution, possibly a parliamentary uh, form of federation, as Navalny has been suggesting. I mean, a complete change, which is possible. We know this. I mean, Germany went through this process. Germany, which committed some of the most atrocious, hideous evils of the 20th century, is now a great free and democratic country. So we know it's possible for countries to change, for people to change, for ways of doing things to change. It's just, it's the defeat of Russia in this imperialist venture is clearly a precondition. Um, and I don't think what will come after that will play out very nicely for the, the coming years. But maybe down the end, there we can have some hope that something more positive, a Russia federal, not federal, parliamentary, not parliamentary, but a Russia that has learned its place in the world and can live with its neighbors instead of constantly trying to expand its territory will finally come into being. And this is, you know, what we have to hope for. Uh, so, Ambassador Taylor, we are almost out of time. I'm going to give you the final word. And I guess, I, you know, I know we're talking a lot about what happens after the war and, you know, what kind of Russia we can envision. Um, while while this is still very much an ongoing conflict and uh you know in fact you know we're right at a very important moment in that conflict why do you think it is uh uh you know and what is the pitch you think that might be more effective than what is occurring to get more support for ukraine from outside of uh the this core group of supporters the united states and uh western europe uh, if you had uh, Prime Minister Modi in the room to yourself today, you know what 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 would you say to him? What you know what? Why is it not resonating? Uh, you know the 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 atrocities that we're talking about, uh, the threat to uh, international order and stability that that a kind of invasion of one's neighbor like this represents. What what's your what's your pitch to the rest of the world? Susan, we've talked about it before um, earlier in this in this discussion. Uh, that is, uh, all, all nations want to feel secure in their borders. All nations want to be sovereign um, next to their neighbors. Um, they don't want to be invaded with part of their territory um, annexed. Um, uh, this is the this is the basic message. They don't want to be a colony um, of a more powerful neighbor. Um, this may also appeal to uh, some. <clears throat> Um, so, but but let me go back to the other question real quickly about uh, about Russia. Um, it seems like we have to think about uh, Russia in two phases. One phase is as long as Putin or someone like Putin is in power, um, and there the world looks certainly Europe looks like uh, uh, looks like NATO with Ukraine um, in it, um, and just to deter and contain Russia as long as as Putin is in power. After that, then week after Putin is gone, and there's a new, and, and as uh, Jonathan says, there may be, um, or as Vladimir says, there may be uh, uh, a new form of government. Um, it, if they give up empire, they give up empire, they give up imperial instinct, then there could be a new security architecture to take a look at. Um, nuclear powers don't always win. Nuclear powers don't always win wars. The, the French didn't win in Algeria. The Americans didn't win in, uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, the Russian, the Soviets did not win in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, th this, you know, Ukraine can win this war. Um, and with our support, we need to continue to provide that. Well, that's an important and I guess uh, maybe optimistic note to end on. Uh, I, I really want to thank uh, all of you for these really thoughtful and important responses and especially for having such a historically grounded conversation, uh, you know, about something where we, we don't know uh, yet so many variables, uh, but I think we can, can look to how we got here uh, in part for 
answers to the question of of how to go forward. And so I really I want to appreciate all of you for participating in this and to Aspen for convening us today. In fact, we're going to just quickly go to the executive director of the Aspen Institute in Kyiv for a few closing remarks, uh, and that is Yulia Chikivska. Uh, thank you so much, Yulia, and to all of our panelists. Thank you, Susan. Uh, fabulous moderation, as always. Thank you, all the participants, Ambassador Taylor, uh, Jonathan, Alexandra, and Vladimir. I think this existential questions we were raising today is very important for our global Aspen network and all our international colleagues and friends who are placed all around the world. Because uh, we at Aspen, our, one of my big part of our mission is uh, value-based leadership and promotion of value-based leadership. And we keep telling, we keep explaining that we consider values not as some declarations. We consider values as an actions, the way you act, the, the way you take decisions, which decision it makes. So I think that's a long, like almost year and a half uh, passed for the whole world uh, about values, which values we, 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 really, we really live. And uh, I'm really grateful to all our international asset partners for, for showing by their actions their values and to all our partners, all the supporters. We feel the solidarity of the whole democratic world. Uh, in different uh, from different core corners and we as ukrainians we are very grateful for the support it's very important to understand that we need to win the war on the ground now and we have to think about the future uh we will think about future of russia in certain point but it's very important to win now and it's very important to support ukraine with weapons now economically as well and um, uh, with this, I would like to thank you all and uh, just one more time to share that we as an Aspen Institute in Ukraine are very open for the international dialogue and we are always uh, open for um, raising quite a difficult questions and uh, to have this respectful exchange of ideas and thoughts. Thank you, Susan, for your wonderful moderation and I wish you um, all wonderful, uh, great rest of the day. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. Thank you so much.